Austerity. It's big in Europe. It's getting big here. Everyone in the Prime Minister has been talking about it. But what is it? It's the common sense on how to pay for the massive increase in public debt caused by the financial crisis. Mostly through the slashing of government services. First you take on debt, then you pay it off. Sounds simple, right? Unfortunately, it's never that simple because austerity confuses virtue with vice. Let me explain why. Now that supposedly the worst of the crisis is over, there's debt everywhere. Credit cards, mortgages, government debt. This is the part you know. But we need to remember how we got here. Two years ago, the world's financial system exploded. The crisis blew a $2 trillion hole in financial space-time. And collectively, the rich governments of the world spent, lent, or guaranteed between 5 and 50% of their country's annual products saving the banks. Given this, you might think that a period of austerity is a good idea. But to see why it's not, you have to think about the world as a series of balance sheets. I, I know, stay with me. Whether you're a person, a household, a firm, or a state, you have assets and liabilities. A balance sheet. Before the crisis in 2008, everyone took on a lot of debt. Back then, it made sense for many of us to take on debt. For example, the bottom 40% of the US income distribution hasn't had a real wage increase since 1979. Really, that's true. Corporates, especially banks, did the same. But they did it to make money rather than to pay the bills. It's called leverage, which is pretty much debt seen from a different perspective. Levering up is a little like going double or nothing in blackjack. If you've taken on debt from a mortgage, you hope your house will increase in value. If you think there's a high chance the value will increase, you might go double or nothing and take on a bigger mortgage. But like blackjack, there's always the risk of losing. So the banks created mountains of debt. They levered up 20, 30 times. It was like they'd pushed in all the blackjack chips, but each chip was just an IOU. So when it all went wrong, governments felt they had to step in and bail them out because they'd become too big to fail. This is where the balance sheet problem comes in and why the common sense of austerity is not so simple. If you're levered up in debt and your assets lose value, your house or your housing derivatives portfolio if you're a bank, your balance sheet as a whole is now underwater. When this happens, whether you're a corporate treasurer or a single mom, if you've got cash coming in, you'll want to pay down the debt to bring your balance sheet above water rather than spend money, which means no one is spending. And that's when the government comes in. If the whole private sector is deleveraging, paying back debt, then government automatically levers up to compensate. Tax revenue falls, so the deficit increases. Unemployment benefits kick in, and public consumption takes the place of private consumption. Now make no mistake, the problem is debt. There is too much of it across the board, and we need to clean those public and those private balance sheets. But all these pieces are connected. If the public sector cleans its balance sheet at the same time as the private sector, then the whole economy craters. It's called a fallacy of composition. What's good for any one household or firm or even state is a disaster if we all try it at once. So why then have most governments of the world decided to do exactly this and all at the same time? Well, remember that two trillion dollar hole in space time? The answer is that someone has to pay for it and no one, especially the banks, wants to. So governments have to either increase taxes, difficult, or slash services, easier, especially when the policy has the common sense ring of virtue about it. Austerity, the pain after the party. But here's the kicker, the hangover of austerity is not going to be felt the same across the income distribution. Earlier this year, the Forum for the Governments of the World's Most Economically Developed States, the Group of 20, called for growth-friendly fiscal consolidation. Which, like a unicorn with a bag of magic salt, is a nice idea but is pretty much bull****. Precisely because this consolidation doesn't hit everyone in the same way. Remember those folks in the bottom 40% of the income distribution that didn't really benefit from the financial boom? All they got was debt and the illusion of prosperity? They're the ones that actually use government services, those services that are about to be so virtuously consolidated. Those at the top end of the income distribution, those who made the mess in the first place, don't. So where does this common sense virtue of austerity leave us? It leaves us in a cycle where those at the bottom end of the income distribution pay for those at the top with the same stagnant and skewed incomes that now buy less in a more unequal and unstable economy. There's a term for this, class politics, and it usually ends badly. 
This common sense of austerity, of reducing public debt all at once through slashing services, involves a question of equity. Who pays and who doesn't? Those who made this mess won't, while those who already paid for it through the bailouts will pay again through austerity. This is why austerity is not common sense. It's a nonsense and a dangerous one at that.